Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me in the locker room on this Thursday, May 25th. I'm Alan Locker. Marnie Schulenberg would have turned 39 four days ago on May 21st and should be here today celebrating with us. But instead, we are gathered to celebrate the life of this beautiful daughter, wife, mother, and talented actress that we lost way too soon. Marnie's husband, Zach Robodas, and I are here to share memories of Marnie and tell you about Marnie's Army, which was formed to honor the legacy of this remarkable woman by supporting breast cancer research and the Cape Cod Theater and Music. Joining Zach today to share memories are Guiding Lights, Bonnie Dennison, and her As the World Turns co-stars, Tala Ash, Eric William Morris, and Jake Silberman. Five months after Marnie and Zach's daughter Coda was born, Marnie was diagnosed with stage four metastatic triple negative inflammatory breast cancer, IBC. Marnie, Zach, and their family decided to share Marnie's diagnosis with their friends on Facebook. They never anticipated the response. Over the next two and a half years, Marnie's army Facebook group grew close to 1,000 people. This army gave them the kind of support you usually see from immediate family members who love each other unconditionally. Marnie loved her family, friends, theater, and music. The few expletives she ever uttered were when she talked about cancer. Let's help Marnie's army grow and grow to become a force of support for the Cape Cod theater and music and an overwhelming enemy of cancer. I hope all of you watching today will join the army and donate a dollar, whatever you can, to Marnie's army fund via the Cape Cod Foundation. The link is down below on the YouTube page. I will put it up on screen momentarily. Please help me welcome Zach Robodas to the locker room. Wow. Hey, Zach. Alan, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> that was beautiful. Beautiful <laughs> tribute, beautiful intro. Thank you. Well, thank you. You were, you are very welcome. Um, you know, w such a loss. She, she was so loved and I'm just glad we could all be here today to celebrate her in this way. I also know her dad wanted to be here. Um, it, it definitely her birthday and the March last weekend, quite a tough week, I'm sure for all of you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it certainly takes uh, a certain amount of like mental, gymnastics to sort of you know naturally we always want to talk about marnie and it's also very hard to talk about marnie so uh <laughs> just thank you you know for your grace and understanding there and uh, i i haven't really you know spoken to many people publicly um but uh the fact that you you know you you had marnie on after diagnosis and you've always handled handled her story just with with grace and care and so um, I'm happy to have these conversations as a part of the sort of uh, digital footprint around her story. Well, uh, her dad is here. <laughs> ah, so I'm going to bring out Mr. Schulenberg right nice. now. Nice. There he is. Hey, Johnny. There he is. <laughs> hey, Zach. Alan, nice to meet you. You as well. I am incredibly sorry for your loss. Thank you for letting us honor your daughter this way and being here today. Well, thank you for doing so. It, it, it is my pleasure. Let me, before I forget, I'm going to put the link to Marnie's Army right there up on screen. Thank um, you. I know uh, this past Saturday, May 20th, CODA led Marnie's March to Millway, which raised money to support breast cancer research and the Cape Cod Theater and Music in her mom's honor. Uh, <laughs> let's look at this uh, great picture of CODA leading the, leading the way. <laughs> Um, tell us about the event. Tell us about the turnout. Oh, we had, um, uh, I had hoped for um, this first March, uh, I had hoped we might get 30 or 40 people. We had close to 200, Alan, um, including our virtual wow. marches, including our virtual marches from all across the country. Uh, we sold out our t-shirts. Um, we raised some money. Uh, we've already had some awards made in Marnie's name to uh, her alma mater, the Barnesville High School Music Program and the uh, uh, Comedy Club of Cape Cod, a very reputable theater organization. So we're, we're just getting started, Alan, but it was a smashing success uh, doing no part to, to 
Zach's help and all the wonderful people who helped make this happen. Coda is uh, going to be four in December, right? That's right. Yep. Uh, does does she understand what's going on? Did she know? You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, she understood early, like at two and a half when Marnie passed. Mm-hmm. She went into a bit of a a regression. You know, for sure, understood that that something was off, something was different, and every day. You know, we talk about Marnie every day. She asks about mom or talks about mom. There are pictures everywhere and we do videos. Um, so as much as a three-year-old can understand, uh, right. she she gets it. Yeah. Um, I had some great advice uh, early on that I would pass on to anyone that would have to deal with anything like this. Uh, that is to just never miss an opportunity to teach your young ones about death. We sort of, um, you know, you see uh, something dead on the side of the road. You're sort of like, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's move along. And I had some great advice saying, those are all opportunities to teach your child about life cycles. And uh, when we were actually visiting uh, Candy and John uh, at Marnie's house, a couple weeks after Marnie had passed, there was uh, just a little fallen dead bird out back on the deck. And I sort of had that impulse as I'm walking past it with Coda to just come on, keep walking. Don't look at that. That's weird. Uh, and then I heard that advice in my head and I was like, okay, this, let's stop and talk about this. And I used uh, like a lot of the same language that I used to talk to her about what had happened to Marnie. You know, the bird's body stopped working. We can't play with the bird. The bird has died. No sort of ambiguity or language about heaven or hell or spirit, just very literal matter of fact stuff. And for the rest of the weekend, she just wanted to go back and, and sort of just check in on the bird and just inspect it and, and see it. And so, you know, kids get it. Kids get a lot more than, uh, than you give them credit for. I'm so glad you shared that because I, I've had friends, you know, at adult age who have been afraid to, to go to somebody's memorial where I think that's ridiculous because it's a way to honor people. And it, it's probably because they didn't have that, that education basically, you know, to treat it in such a way that not, not to fear it. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, that has always been a guiding principle for us through this whole thing is that the way forward is through and the harder something feels, um, the more you should do it. And, you know, just going back to Marnie's house and staying in the room where Marnie grew up was, felt impossible. And the harder something has felt, the more I've been like, okay, we're doing this. Because if I don't, then I'm going to be like your friend and I'm not going to do anything. I'll just, you know, isolate myself from the memory and from the person. Like, that's the only other way I would know how to do it. And so early on, I decided I'm going to eulogize her and I'm going to do the hard stuff and sort of lean into it. Um, and that's not, I'm, mean, that's just been what has worked for me. I don't, everyone's sort mm-hmm. of grief journey is, is different and how they grieve uh, a loved one, but that has certainly been what's worked for, for us. Well, and I think part of that is taking a page from your wife and your daughter, you know, her, her strength is, is piercing through both of you and all of your family, I'm sure, because of how she led this fight was, something to you know admire in 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 a, in a weird way i mean it, you know she had to fight this horrible disease but she did it with such grace and perseverance that i only wish i i, I will have if that day comes you know <laughs> truly um you know n- no sort of <sighs> Uh, self-pity or self-doubt which is why it was such a surprise you know when she passed like you couldn't believe it and to anybody on the outside looking in they'd say well she had stage four metastatic cancer tumor growing out of her neck she was carrying around an oxygen tank like of course you know but you just couldn't believe it because her spirit alan like from the moment she was diagnosed remained the same she stayed forward she stayed actionable she researched doggedly she was her own best self advocate, which she would tell anyone to do and to be. Um, and she just didn't, we, it's not to say we didn't get down in, in, in the mucky muck, bad, bad, sad times, but we didn't stay there long. 
Um, and so you showed pictures of the march. And I think on, if you wanted to bring it up again, on the back of the shirt is actually, she helped, she has helped us uh, through grief. Uh, you can sort of see the letters, find your way back. It's something that she coined. She made a shirt for me on my birthday the year before she passed. And she used Coda's symbol, the Coda symbol, Coda's name for the musical symbol, a navigational symbol and yeah. music, sheet music. When a musician gets lost, you can just return to the coda. And she added that and the phrase, find your way back. And um, just gave it to me as a sort of like in a, in, a, in a workout shirt to say like, hey, like go get lost, whatever, feel what you're feeling, <laughs> but get back here. You know, like it's such a, it, why I love the phrase is it is very uh, forgiving. It doesn't say, you know, don't push through your feelings or don't feel what you're feeling. It's like, it's, built into that phrase is the recognition that there's going to be shitty days uh but you should just come on back we have somebody watching um i don't know their their name their the screen name is hg writes she was diagnosed stage 3c triple neg ibc in march of 2022 and just finished active treatment last month doing well but being marnie's age and early in treatment um, Mr. Schulenberg, can you talk about the charities and why they're they're so important to Marnie? Alan, and, I would and just yourself? encourage her. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but if yeah, she yeah, doesn't, if she ahead. isn't yet part of the IBC network, um, it's an organization that Marnie found just tremendous support and relief from, and she probably knows about it. But just to say that the IBC network was a a place to chat with uh, other folks going through something similar with what she was going with uh, going through and uh, was just a great community for her throughout her fight. I, I will play before I, uh, l later on, and, and Mr. Schulenberg, if you want, I can pull you off screen, but I, I do have Marnie talking about her uh, diagnosis and the IBC network and encouraging people to be involved there as well. But I would love to know, uh, you know, the charities that we are raising money for, why are they so important? Um, well, they're the things, things that uh, Marnie loved. Uh, when um, the, they are Cape Cod Music and Theater, which she was involved in, um, and specifically the IBC Network, which raises money to support the operation of the network, which, as Zach said, was very important to Marnie, but also donates money specifically to in research for inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, and one of the things Marnie and I found, we made many trips together, the two of us to Dana-Farber. And one of the things we learned is that her primary oncologists, both at MSK and Dana-Farber were quite frustrated with the, the money that went to specifically to research for IBC. So I am the donor advisor for Marnie's Army Fund under the umbrella of the Cape Cod Foundation, uh, a local group that started about 10 years ago with a $10,000 grant, and now their assets are close to $100 million, and they are very impressive and very supportive. As the advisor, it's my job to direct the money raised to the things that Marnie loved, and one of those is the IBC Network. Um, we learned a number of times in speaking with our oncologists that uh, the possibility of meaningful cancer research lies in learning more about the way the cells in inflammatory breast cancer produce. They're almost like a virus. If there can be knowledge gained in that area, it would have probably a, a greater ripple effect than any of the minuscule targeted areas where cancer funds go to. So that's our primary cancer, breast cancer research uh, award E or whatever the word is. And then of course, Cape Cod Music and Theater. All that can be done going to marniesarmy.org. Right on the homepage, it says donate now is a big button. Click there and you can join. We have a choir, the army has a choir. You can be a tenor, bass, alto, soprano. You can be a director or you can give more. <laughs> And all of it is um, immediately tax deductible. Um, so go there, join the choir and do more. Thank you, Alan.
You, you are so welcome. For all the negative conversations truly about social media, can you tell us how Marnie's Army came to be and, and what it has meant to you over these last couple of years? Yeah, it was um, it was a place for um, all of the unexpressed love for Marnie and a place for people to take action. It was a time where everyone was inside, everyone was indoors, and everyone was living in fear of this invisible COVID thing. And here was uh, a person that was dealing with something even crazier even more absurd and something that people could sort of sink their teeth into and and to take action against and to um use it probably to give themselves a little perspective about you know what real problems are and so um a friend just started a, a facebook group and uh it was comprised of people that marnie has um collected over the years by living <laughs> the way that she lived her life by putting people first by always leading um truly by trying to make you feel at ease and make you feel comfortable and make you feel happy and the army was vast and diverse and nimble and set up food chains and set up um donations of of breast milk you know we couldn't uh we marnie was having trouble f feeding coda at that time um because of the infection and so these people just showed up and did what they could and left flowers on our doorstep and just created a community in a time when like you know, everybody was just feeling isolated. You're going through a thing that you just want family around. You just want people around you. And everyone, the world was saying, separate, don't be together, especially you, you're immunocompromised, you're sick. The army made sure that, um, that, that we didn't feel isolated, that we had, you know, that we had community that we were taken care of. Um, the army. That, that is, and that is the power of love. That is the power of Marnie's, being that is the power of uh community really um, truly and the power of social media you said it perfectly like yeah like hard to be cynical about a thing that you know is very easy to be cynical about um you hear it all the time oh social media get off of it but when it uh puts you know medicine uh you know and food and provides for your family it's hard to be cynical about it hmm. Betsy says, as a fellow wi widowed parent, she's sending you lots of strength vibes. So sorry for your loss. Um, I am going to play that clip, if that's okay, of Marnie sure. talking about the disease, because I think it's important for people to hear it in her words. Uh, this is my first time speaking publicly and live about this. So like a good actress, I'll be working from a script. Uh, in case I become a bit of a hot mess. <laughs> um, I think it's pretty safe to assume that everyone watching has had someone they know impacted by breast cancer in some way. Um, this year alone, over 325,000 women have been diagnosed. But uh, if you're anything like me, uh, it wasn't really on my daily radar because it hadn't impacted me yet in a profoundly and irrevocable way. You know, I didn't always know, remember that October was Breast Cancer Awareness Month, nor did I have any idea that there isn't a cure for everyone who gets breast cancer. And I certainly had never heard of inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer, we believe, accounts for 1% to 5% of those diagnosed with breast cancer each year, although it's possible it accounts for more and it just goes unreported or is misdiagnosed um, due to it being understudied in general. It commonly affects younger women, like myself, uh, and rarely presents itself with a lump making early detection almost impossible. Even if you do uh, make a diagnosis or try to get one early with IBC, it's never less than a stage three due to the fact that it invades your lymphatic system involving the skin from the get-go. Some find it by noticing like an odd bug bite or rash on their breast that won't go away or others like myself assume it's a clogged mouth duct or mastitis, a common breastfeeding infection and, and treat it as so and lose precious time. It's quite insidiously brilliant how it disguises itself and infects the one area that is your baby's life source. It's not commonly picked up by mammograms, especially 
when you're a breastfeeding mother. So being your own advocate is key. Now, I could talk so much more about my personal journey and inflammatory breast cancer in general. But if you're interested in knowing more, I recommend that you check out the IBC Network Foundation page, which was a beacon of hope and enlightenment, enlightenment for me during some of my darkest early days of diagnosis, along with the amazing outreach of our community. So if you're someone who's messaged me or sent a care package or something and I never thank you, please know that we are beyond grateful. Uh, however, what is most important to me before we take this wonderful stroll down nostalgia lane with my ETWT family, is that you all remember the importance of your own voice. We have an incredible medical community who are literally risking their lives every day for the sake of humanity right now, but they are also stretched so thin. You are one of, uh, you are one of many to them, but you only have one of you. Now, I was hounding people in the middle of a global pandemic when I thought what was mastitis wouldn't go away. I spoke to two lactation consultants, one occupational therapist, uh, one breast specialist, and my OBGYN. I had three courses of antibiotics, two ultrasounds, two mammograms, and three biopsies over the course of two and a half months, and symptom pro symptoms progressed in over three months before I was officially diagnosed. And it would have been much longer to a diagnosis if I just waited for my medical care team to tell me what next steps to take, and most definitely too late for me. And even now, five months into treatment, I don't go into a single appointment without my notebook of, of questions about what proactive steps I can take to better my chances. Instead of waiting for symptoms to happen to me that could be precursors to of something more serious, I've learned the importance of educating myself on how to avoid those symptoms in the first place. Especially as women, we can sometimes be written off as hysterical or reactive. But you know your own body. They don't. It communicates with you on a daily basis. Listen to it because it could be the difference of your life. I mean, I really felt it was very important to hear that from Marnie herself. Um, the best lesson anyone could take away is to be your own advocate, male or female, whoever you are, you need to be the best advocate for yourself. Mr. Schulenberg, can I read that letter that you sent me? Sure, I'd be honored if you would. Okay, it's a letter that uh, you wrote to your church choir director of 30 years. She knew and loved Marnie from the time she was 10 years old and accompanied the two of you numerous times when you sang together in, in church services. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for your call and for staying in touch, my dear friend. I'm sorry I missed your welcome home party and hearing all about your trip, but I am nowhere near my old self these days. As much as a father and daughter could be best friends, Marnie and I certainly were. Our relationship grew even closer after her diagnosis. As much as humanly possible, I made myself knowledgeable about the hundreds of medical tests she endured. Subsequent medications, their side effects, possible diagnosis, etc. We communicated with each other multiple times on a daily basis. The brutally savage and random nature of what my little girl had to endure in the last two and, two and a half years of her life is incomprehensible and overwhelming to me. Anyone who has lived for 76 years has certainly had their share of sadness, grief, and sorrow. Nothing I have experienced even comes close to this. Over the last two and a half years, I drove her to new, numerous appointments at Dana-Farber in Boston. Our conversations range from giggling and laughing like two best friends to discussions of end of life choices. On more than one occasion, I told her that whatever the future held, having her in my life and being by her side during this time in her life were two the two greatest gifts God ever gave me. Also, on more than one occasion, she made me promise that if she lost her battle, I wouldn't let my grief stop my music and singing. I'm not there yet, but we'll definitely keep that promise to my Marnie. To that end, I ask that you keep me in your choir emails. And if you are ever in charge of any musical offering in the church, I will do my best to be there. Plus mid, -cor mid Cape Chorus is supposed to start up again in the fall if anyone is still alive. So I've got that aim for also. Thanks for taking the time to read this. I love you. Um, Mr. Schulenberg, I hope you have taken up singing again. <laughs> yeah, I just um, finished a series of concerts with the same group 
and was fortunate enough to be a featured soloist on a, a number of them. So I kept my promise to my little girl. That is awesome. Um, before I bring out some of our guests, Zach, talk about your amazing wife's res resilience, or would you want me to play that little thing you sent me first? Either way, you can you can certainly play it. Um, okay. I can set it up so, for you if you'd like. Yeah, or, why yeah. don't you set it? Uh, yeah, you set it up. I. Uh, uh, it was important that I documented um, her resilience, and I did that by cutting together a bunch of self tapes um, that Marnie had put down, uh, despite her body going through just so many changes. It is it is a really hard thing, you know, acting in front of a camera when you know you have a pimple on your face or you just got got a haircut you don't like and so as a tumor is taking over her neck as she's shaving her hair as she's going through all this stuff she just didn't let it stop her from doing the stuff that she loved and from living her life and it's sort of that just staying forward thing that i'm talking about and you see it in that video you just played like her spirit was undeniable through the entire thing i don't know how many rounds of chemo she was doing i don't know how how many rounds she had gone through by the time you guys had did that interview but it just she stayed purpose and she stayed forward and so it didn't matter and so she got herself wigs and got herself new headshots so that she can keep auditioning and eventually um she he, booked a show. He, this is this is a beautiful tribute zach what you what you created so i'm gonna yeah. let's uh sure. give this oops let's see how this works here we go hi i'm marty schulenberg 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 i'm five five i am five five I'm five five. I am five five. Five five. And I'll just three things. Honey, hi. Mwah. I'm sorry. I'm so confused. I don't understand this at all. And in true fourth grade fashion, she left it at home. So after today's treatment, I'll be running it over. I'm through accepting limits. Are you kidding me? You know, did it ever occur to you that maybe I want someone to take care of? And how could I know that it was a cult? If I had my way, you would quit the BPD completely. But the decision's not up to me, so fuck all that. <laughs> all right, thank you. Yeah, amazing, truly. Um, different, just different. <laughs> It's a different kind of person. yeah she 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 had um uh, you know she had something that i don't think a lot of us have i mean that's yeah. what i'll share able one to... yeah. one story about city on the hill that i like to tell uh that sort of exemplifies who she was she uh i came down one morning and there was like all these uh it was like 150 dollars worth of gourmet donuts from like the local whatever like <laughs> high-end pastry shop and i was like what are all these boxes and she was going to set and uh she said i need to i need to thank hair and makeup and costumes for covering up my cancer <laughs> and uh if you know she didn't need to do that <laughs> you know right but it was important to her that she thanked them for their discretion and for not making a big deal about it and for telling creative and to just sort of like, they were always so, um, you know, they were just, just showed her great, tremendous care and discretion. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, on that note, some of Marnie's friends uh, wanted to be here, wanted to stop by and share their memories of Marnie Please welcome Guiding Lights, Bonnie Dennison, and from As the World Turns, Eric William Morris, and some Ooh. others will be here as well. <laughs> Bonnie's Hello, already Bonnie. crying. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I could see that she was. I thought she was. Uh, should have brought Bonnie in before the video. Should have got her before the video. Should have caught me. 
<laughs> I'll get it together. Probably not. <laughs> I, I, Ani, you know, because you weren't on the same show, how did you first meet um, Marnie? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we would meet at soap events and stuff because as the world turns in Guiding Light, we're like, you know, sister sister soaps and so same sort of charity events and things. Um, so I knew her, but it, we weren't especially close uh, back when I was on Guiding Light. Um, <clears throat> and it wasn't until years later, my writing directing partner, uh, Allison Barton, knew Zach from a production and we kind of put together that, oh, wait, so we have Marnie as a shared friend and we got back in touch and both she and Zach were just always so um, willing to be a part of our table reads or a short we were doing or whatever. And she was just so truly passionate about acting and helping people and um, just the enthusiasm and the talent that she had was amazing. So we got back in touch in that way. And then when I announced I was pregnant, um, on like Instagram, she messaged me and she's like, I haven't told anyone, but I'm due like the exact same date basically. Um, and that's when we really got close because, you know, it was the first kid, kids for both of us. And um, that was just so special to have someone who's going the exact same thing. And uh, we just, you know, that, 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 it, that's it's something to bond over for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. and, and Eric, you mm -hmm. met Marnie when you were cast as Matt O'Connor, correct? That's the first yes, time. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Did you um, have to audition at all with Marnie? You know, I did not have to audition at all with Marnie. By the way, hey, hey, Zach, how you doing? Hey, buddy. How are you? <laughs> Lovely to meet you. How are you? Uh, I did not, but um, once I started working on the show, Marnie had been there, uh, I think, for a little over a year as a regular, and I came on uh, as a recurring. It was it was going to be a couple of months, and I wasn't sure what I was doing there, and then they uh, slowly but surely started to write a lot of scenes for Marnie and I, and she... Uh, she like took me right under her wing immediately in a way that she did not need to. Uh, and I was always very, very uh, thankful for that. Um, so that's how I got to know her. And that must've been 2007. Yeah. A, a, a long, a long time ago. Um, Bonnie, when I interviewed uh, Marnie in probably April or May of 2020, she talked mm -hmm. about, you know, Coda and your twins are about 10 days apart, I think. Yeah, yeah. And and she she basically I think was amazed at how you were doing it all and texting you for help left and right. What do you remember about those exchanges? Well, that's just like so uh, Marnie to say that I was <laughs> in any way amazing. I mean, having twins is hard. I'll, I'll acknowledge that. But um, no, I mean she was even before the cancer diagnosis. She was pregnant and getting into prenatal yoga instruction and learning about it. And she was at my house giving me a prenatal yoga private session <laughs> while she was fully pregnant. It was just like, you know, so quintessentially her. Um, so she was already very giving in that way, but she, it was great to like, we'd be texting about, you know, the different developmental stages and like none of our children napping and that kind of thing. Um, and it was just great to have someone to compare notes with where they're the exact same age and going through the exact same thing. And um, she just had such a great attitude about parenting and throughout it was, <clears throat> I think she was good at what so many mothers who aren't battling cancer struggle with is like maintaining a well-rounded life and making sure that she took care of herself and did what she loved and um, was a good partner to Zach. Like, she was just very conscious about how she, how she lived. And um, that was an inspiration, continues to be. Yeah. I'd l like to bring out one of her other As the World Turns actual family members, her sister, Kelly Menahan, everybody. Kel, you're on mute. <laughs> There of you course. are. Hi. <laughs> of course you are. Hi, guys. Kelly, this is Zach and her dad, John, and Eric nice and Bonnie. To nice to see you. Thank you for including me. Of course. Thanks for being here. I'm glad, oh, I'm glad you could be here. Um, me too. Do, do you remember meeting Marnie for the first time? Uh, I do. Um, and I have thought about... Um, 
I've thought about this and, and literally the, the first thing that always comes to my mind is fresh face, fresh, <laughs> fresh everything, like just this fresh air. Um, she came into that job, that new life of hers with just excitement and joy and discovery and unaware of really anything other than just let's just go for it and enjoy it um which i related to um and i said to her i remember feeling when i first started that i forgot that we forgot the tapes were rolling you know we were just living in this fun play world and she really brought that to the table every single day um just whimsical and and really grabbed everything she did by the tail of just loving it and enjoying it and didn't think about it didn't 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 second guess what she had done just really just lived it in an unabashed way um and i learned that really when i hear the stories and i hear you guys talk and i've heard everybody talk throughout everything um that's how she did her whole life <laughs> She really just lived her whole life that way. Um, yeah, the nickname "110% Marnie" kind of stuck. She, uh, everyone hearing Eric tell the story of her taking him under his wing, it's like if you met her, that's sort of the experience you had. I shared uh, at the march her mission statement from college. We had a professor that had us all, you know, write a mission statement for the business of us as actors, and the first paragraph is just all about I. I, I want to make people feel at ease. I want them to feel happy. Mm -hmm. I want to do for others. She lived, truly lived that, like in service of other people. And it's sort of a quality that belied her looks, right? Like she would often try to have to convince people that she was as kind and giving as she was because <laughs> she was gorgeous. And uh, it... Um, it's just, it was not, it was effortless. It wasn't anything that was calculated. It was just in her bones and who she was. It wasn't a decision. It was just there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schulenberg, was she like that from a young age? Always. She's, um, my life changed uh, when she was born. I didn't really know it until I looked back over the years how, how I had changed because she was in my life. But since I'm in the presence of some great uh, soap opera actors, I'm compelled to share a quick story about the 2010 Emmy Awards. Um, Marnie was nominated uh, for her work as Emily Stewart, I think, on, on the... Uh, Allison. Uh, Allison, thank you. Allison Stewart on <laughs> As the Turns. And as we approached, we, my wife and I flew out to Vegas, and uh, the day before, I, she and I were talking about we were best friends. Everybody knows that. Uh, we were talking about the red carpet and she had, uh, Zach and his family came out and, and um, I said, you know, uh, I don't see there's a, any question as to who your escort should be on the red carpet. Zach is so handsome. What would that do for his career? Um, <laughs> you know, I said, I, you know, I'm happily will step backwards. I, you know, wouldn't bother me at all if you didn't ask me to be your escort. Well, of course, she snubbed Zach, and I was her escort on the red carpet. Um, <laughs> and that blew his chance. And then my career tanked. That's it. <laughs> when we were in the auditorium waiting for the announcements of who won certain Emmys, Marty's name came up, and she didn't get the award. But like Marty, she was smiling and clapping enthusiastically, and of course, meant it. Um, she and I had a special link between of humor in many different ways. So as the applause is going, I lean over and tap her because we're sitting beside each other, tap her on the shoulder and look at her. And I said, this is just one more in a long list of disappointments from you. And <laughs> she, she had a laugh. We both had a laugh that we called the Tourette's laugh that we just would explode. So the applause is going on and here's a person who didn't get the Emmy in, and she's laughing her ass off and people can't figure out what's going on. So that's a story. Uh, I love um, that. And, and, you know, Kelly, in listening to how you described her from the get go is interesting because both of you 
uh, came in to replace other actors as those characters. And that's a hard thing to do in, in any medium to, to replace another actor and to come in with such that, you know, which is kind of what you did. And you just t took it by storm, the two of you as, as the Stewart sisters. Right. And it's funny, you, I, I can't help but think about Marie, uh, who played our mother, and she's that way. I mean, when you mm. think about it, we're all very similar. It's weird sometimes how the casting world works. I mean, I saw myself in her so much. And, I, and then we both would say, oh, my God, we see ourselves in Marie. We were just very similar people. Like, our hearts were very, are very similar. And that, I think... I think that's why it worked so well and maybe why we had so much fun and there was just a connection and there was a, a sense of um, trust and, and certainly love and respect that we all had for one another. Um, World Turns did that effortlessly over and over again. I don't know. I don't know what that magic it involves because um, it's a casting thing. And I always feel like yeah. cast. And, and a timing thing to, to put yeah. people, you know, to cross paths. Yeah. Um, what, one of the fans uh, said, uh, you know, a lot of the fans are saying she was definitely 100%, 110% with her fans as well. She, uh, she would call me her fellow mass hole because we grew up not far <laughs> from each other uh, on the Cape to, from one of the fans um, uh. a, a, as well. Um, Eric, what, you know, this was one of your first roles on As the World Turns playing opposite uh, Marnie and, and Billy Magnuson. What do you think you learned from Marnie? Uh, actually, the, the, it, it, I was just thinking about the story when Zach uh, said that you'd often have to prove to people that she had like a good heart. It seemed to me like that that was exactly what happened immediately with her. I sort of like learned how to be nice to to people uh, who were in a, like, I was not in a, she was in like a, a more sort of like seasoned position than I was. And then there, you know, you show up and there's these scenes and as somebody who had just come onto the show and, and in total, I did about four or five months, but almost all of it was with Marnie. And I remember after the first scene I did with her, she was really lovely. And then I got the next week's script and like all of my stuff was with her. And I was like, okay, well, I, sh I you know, I'll get to know this this woman, if I can, and I was, I lived in Astoria, Queens at the time where she also lived. And the show shot in Brooklyn, which is about as far away from Astoria as you could get. <laughs> and so I went to the gym in Astoria and I was, it was the night before we were going to do a lot of stuff. And I was thinking to myself, okay, like I have a lot of lines, we're going to get these figured out. And lo and behold, I saw Marnie at the gym because she also lived in Astoria at that point. And she was on a treadmill and I instinctively was like, I'm not going to bother her. Uh, because she's probably got a lot going on and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I put my head down, I did my thing and she got off the treadmill, came up to me and was like, Hey, we have a lot of stuff to do tomorrow. Do you want to go over some lines right now? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So I got on the treadmill next to her at the New York sports club <laughs> and, and we ran the, the mad and alley scenes for like the next week. And just like immediately I was like, Oh, this is how you, uh, treat somebody like I learned very, very easily from her because it was as you're it's such an honor, by the way, to hear you, Zach and you, John, to tell these stories about her, because that was immediately my my experience with her was like, oh, yeah, you just like invite somebody in with open arms and you're perfect with them. And I was just like, oh, cool. So that's how you treat people, essentially, you know? Yeah. Bonnie, for you, for you, when when um, Marnie was diagnosed and watching her go through this with such an amazing resilience what what was it like as as a friend um seeing yeah. somebody with that kind of strength yeah um she that it was just incredible like it um zach said and this is when i first lost it before when zach was talking about how you just couldn't believe that she was gone because that spirit was so strong throughout it just, you know, and she, I would hear updates from her about what was happening. And like you said, like, you, you know, knew, knew what was going on, but like, she was just so, she just never lost that energy that she had. Um, <clears throat> she was just still so, um, 
present with Coda. She was just still such a great mom and still so, you know, and life doesn't stop. So she was still involved in like, you know, feeding her and how do you get her to eat her vegetables and stuff. And we were talking about mom stuff of sneaking veggies in and cooking and all that. And it was all, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a normal that way. And, and like I kind of said before, she, I was just so an inspiration to see her still prioritize A, that she loved acting. So she still was doing those self tapes and I was so, so happy that she, she got the show and she was able to be on set because she just loved it so much. Um, and, you know, me, I, I, as a, I think, lesser person, when you get presented with something like this and there's, you know, how much time you have becomes a question, you get very philosophical about how you spend your time. And she was just so deliberate that she just wanted to make sure that she, she did all the things and she visited friends and she made sure that she was... Um, just still being a full person, living life to the fullest. And it was just really, it was amazing to, to be, to be a part of that. And um, I'm grateful for all the time I got with her. Yeah. I think she made everybody feel uh, like they were the only person yeah. in the room. Exactly. Yeah. There was one time where I was going through an emotional point in my life because COVID everything was hard and she was in the throes of chemo and stuff and she showed up to visit me, Zachy dropped her off. We went for a walk and it was just, um, she's just, she was just amazing how giving she was. Your Instagram posts carried her. She like, if, an, <laughs> if anybody can follow Bonnie, she's a great follow. And I just remember like those, I don't know, whatever videos, new mom videos or pre-mom videos, I would always get a, I would always get a rundown on what Bonnie was up to or making on her uh -huh. Insta and she would bring them over and be like, you gotta watch this and so on. So like those were uh, a boon to her for sure. Um, Kelly, I don't so know if bad. you saw, I don't know if you saw the TikTok that I showed earlier, but I'll send it to you that okay. Zach put together of, of uh, Marnie auditioning throughout her cancer and just, mm -hmm the exuberance she uh, shown. I'd love to um, see it. I have some, you know, I don't want to, if, if Kel, I don't know if you have to go, Jake Silberman and Tala Ash sent messages. So I was going to play them if you're all. Yeah. Hi. Um, Marnie and I met on the set of As the World Turns when we were young actors, and I don't know when or how we became friends, but I just know we were friends right away. And our friendship long outlasted uh, us being on the show. And, you know, we, we grew up together in a way those, those formative years of our 20s, we would, we would get together and usually have Bloody Marys almost always and just unload about you know good things but a lot of the challenges the real challenges of growing up and you know being an actor and, and how hard that can be um and i would always leave feeling better <laughs> and feeling like you know what i I can do this. I have something special to, to offer the world. And actually that was one of Marnie's many superpowers was this ability to make other people feel loved and, and, the, and the specialness when in fact she was the special one, the ability to do that, the generosity of spirit that that requires to love like that and to make other people feel that way is so rare and so precious. And I saw that, I experienced that as a friend and I saw that with Zach and I saw it with Coda. I, I got such joy from watching her pregnant and then becoming a mother because I thought you know there's 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 no one in the world who's more suited to this and who will be more generous with her spirit and that is that is in Coda now um I miss her very much I think about her all the time I love her 
And I guess I, 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 I know we're here to talk about our foundation and I hope that all of you will donate um, on behalf of, of Marnie because even when she was sick, she used that generosity of spirit to advocate for awareness so that this doesn't happen to other women. And I hope that we all um, donate, but but mostly, I, I I also want us all to remember that Marnie was truly the best of us, and really as as good as it gets. And I'm sending a lot of love to Zach and Coda and Marnie's family. Uh, I'd cast her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. And Jake wanted to be here and got called away at last minute, but he sent something as well. Uh, Marty started as a colleague uh, who very swiftly became a friend. And uh, for three and a half years, we were uh, on the same show together. And as the world turns, um, we hardly ever worked together actually on set, but uh, hers was a name I was always very, very happy to see on the call sheet, just to know that she was there. I loved seeing her getting ready in hair and makeup. We had this bit where um, you know, she'd be getting her hair blow dried and kind of mime a conversation to each other as though, um, as though we could hear it. <clears throat> and I always, I always picture her smiling. Um, that big, light up the room, Marnie's smile. Uh, or her smiling and then turning to you to confide to you what she was really thinking. That big thing that she couldn't say. Um, you know, in the years after the show ended, we didn't see each other a lot, but um, the times <clears throat> we did were really special for me. And the one time that I asked that I, I needed it, she was there just to, to listen. Marnie was hilarious. She was insightful. She was so kind. She was charming and she was beautiful. Uh, I can't believe it's already been a year. And um, I will miss her, miss her always. Love you, Jake. Love you, Tala. Thank you. Um, Kel, Eric, Bonnie, is there a favorite memory you have that comes to mind? I, I mean, first of all, the the message from everybody is, is the same. I mean, what she how she made all of us feel was across the board. I don't think it was different with anybody. I liked just, like I said, we lived in the same neighborhood and the amount of times I ran into her uh, uh, was sort of like fascinating afterwards in that neighborhood. I, I remember one of the last times I saw her in the neighborhood, she was outside of a restaurant called Mars, which became sort of like a favorite. Uh, of me and my wife as well. Uh, and she was just reading a book, eating tiramisu in the middle of the day uh, by her. And, and so, and she was by herself and Elise and I were like, let's go bother Marnie. So we did. And we just sort of like hung out with her for a little while. And there was never any, there was never, there was never like a doubt to whether I would be welcome going to bother her by herself. And uh, I feel like that sort of sums up a lot of the stories that I've been hearing today and that I've experienced. Also the thing Jake said about smiling and then turning to you with what she really thought was <laughs> real good. <laughs> Bonnie. Yeah, I'm, Bo 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 Bonnie yeah. keeps crying. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot. I mean, it's hard to pick one. Um, I, I one of the first thing that came to mind was like I just love seeing um, Marnie and Zach acting together. It was one of my favorite things in the world. Like if we asked you two to do like a short or like we did like a marathon fundraising video. <laughs> For, for Allison and it, the two of you together performing was just my favorite. The pattern that you guys had, the way you played off of each other, just to see that, that was that was the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, but but just also have yeah have 
how sweet she was, but again, without being, she was always real. Like there was still the biting humor that came in after that. And um, yeah, she was just fantastic. Her, her smile lit up a room really. Yeah. Zach, before we go, um, I'm gonna play a montage at the end. Um, you two met in college. What talk about how you met and you know, for people who might not know. Yeah, her best friend was giving a, a tour uh, of the school. I was a transfer student and she, the friend called Marnie over and said, hey, this guy's thinking about coming here for theater. You're in theater. And she was wearing a music is everything sweatshirt and <laughs> proceeded to talk about the theater program for what felt like an hour. <laughs> just went hog. You know, the same thing, Eric, like just welcoming and just was her exuberant and just like, sure, happy, eager to help. And uh, I was just like, OK, theater nerd, like take a break, uh, avoid her when I come here. <laughs> Program sounds great. She seems dodgy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then like you know and then you go and you meet her and you realize like oh she's just that with every human she's just that excited and has that much spirit and uh and then you fall in love mm -hmm. that's amazing did you uh get to perform on stage professionally i know all the time yeah we went back uh our summers were spent at the pennsylvania shakespeare festival so we'd go back you know a number of summers and uh yeah we were we were collaborators and we helped each other with every cell tape. Yeah. Favorite, All... favorite. Uh, we got to do problem. as you like it. And uh, it was just great to watch her do Rosalind and to, you know, be Orlando and especially do it at like an older age where you get to sort of like rekindle that, you know, that young love and, um, it was it was one of the it was the last time I saw her. I got to read some. I read some Shakespeare. I read some of that play to her, and the scene where they you know meet and fall in love in a second, and uh, just from seeing each other. And um, I think when I finished the whatever the chapter of the the scene, she just sort of smiled and was like, "Yeah, right," or <laughs> something. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Alan. You, you are so welcome, Mr. Schulenberg. Um, anybody watching, please, a dollar, ten dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, whatever you can afford, please go to marniesarmy.org and make a donation. Um, you all, if you'd like to stay, I'm going to play this video right now. Uh, thank you, Kelly, Eric, thank Bonnie, you. Mr. Schumer. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you, Kelly, guys. Eric, and Bonnie. It's nice thank to you for having Thank us. you, John. Thank really. you again, Alan. Thank you. Jack, I love you. I'll see you in a little while. See you, pal. <laughs>